was the dead drop, a memory stick. They would record messages onto the memory sticks and then hide them behind a soft drink machine inside the center where they later could be retrieved. They therefore believed that their communications would be secure. But in fact, nothing could have been further from the truth. There was little that Amara did or said that the police didn't know. How would you describe the scale of the police and intelligence service operation? Massive. I can't tell you how much it cost. I can't tell you how many agents were involved, or how many man hours were expended, but I know that it is immense. Amara was looking for someone who could supply the huge quantity of chemicals needed for the bombs. At a clandestine meeting in a restaurant, Amara passed a scrap of paper to someone he believed could get hold of them. On it was written, nitric acid, two gallons, ammonium nitrate, 1.5 tons. Just after nine o'clock one April evening, police covertly broke into Amara's flat here in Meadowvale Gardens. Inside, they found a bomb-making manual, a video on how to mix chemicals to make an explosion, and instructions on how to trigger it using a mobile phone. Amara was now close to putting his bomb together, but he'd no intention of making himself a martyr he'd built a remote control detonator that could work from a distance. And to prove it to the rest of the cell, he made this video. At another meeting a few days later, a firm order for the chemicals was made and money changed hands. The shipment will be arriving either on the 3rd or the 5th, either on Monday or Sunday, inshallah. As for the instructions, um, I think, inshallah, that will happen soon. With the chemicals on their way, Amara now had to find somewhere to store them. So he sent Khaled and another member of the cell here to make the necessary arrangements. But before they went, he gave them a set of instructions scrawled on a scrap of paper. They said, make sure you're not followed. Only volunteer information that is asked. Don't sound like a child. Be confident. Allah is on your side. With Khalid and another teenager waiting inside, a delivery truck arrived at the lockup unit. Amara had told them to shave off their beards and to smoke cigarettes in order to avoid suspicion, but it was far too late for that. The entire incident was captured on police surveillance cameras, one of which was concealed in the back of the truck. After their arrest, the authorities tested a bomb made from the ingredients Amara had ordered. The result revealed its devastating power. The carnage would have been horrendous. But the plot had been fatally compromised from the very beginning. When your client rang the person concerned with regard to renting the lockup, the person he knew as Terry. Yes. Had he any idea who Terry really was? You mean that he was a police agent? Of course not. No. If he'd known, I suppose he would have uh, uh, stopped in his tracks. No, the, the police were very good at disguising their agents. Uh, nobody knew. N none of the plotters knew they were dealing with the cops. The delivery that Amara thought was fertilizer was actually a harmless substitute. And the man who supplied the chemicals was also on the police payroll. Nor did the plotters know that some of the people they were plotting with were actually paid police informants. 
Mubin Sheikh wanted a handsome reward for his part in infiltrating the cell, but he drove a hard bargain. Uh, I requested more money, 2.7 million is my... 2.7 million, tax-free. You've got to be joking. No joke. Because my life now, it's not, uh, you know, I have to think about the safety of my family, to get them out of the country if I have to as soon as possible, and to get plane tickets and to find a place to live and stuff like that. I'm not doing it for the money. Whether they pay me or they don't, I will still be there. I will still be there and I still commit to the evidence that I collected then, that I've testified to in court, and that will still be the case going forward. Any controversy over his demands evaporated late last year when Amara and Khalid both pleaded guilty. They've also apologized for what they did. Khalid was sentenced to 12 years, while just last month Amara received a life sentence for masterminding the plot. The Muslim community has largely been in denial, and they have been this way since after 9-11, after 7-7, and after the recent Toronto arrests, because um, to, to them it seems that this is some sort of mistake. But why is the community, as you say, in denial? Well, there are many reasons for it. One, they don't want to really accept that there's anything wrong with, Hindu, you know, with, with their own children, so to speak. The, the, the second thing is that this is being done as uh, some sort of conspiracy and this is what has happened with the Muslim community that they close their eyes to the kind of indoctrination that was taking place with their youth, with their children and therefore they never saw what was coming. The plot has confronted Canada's Muslims with serious questions about the vulnerability of their young men to radicalization. To what extent does the problem lie within the Muslim community? Oh, I would say 90% it lies within the Muslim community because after all we are responsible for bringing up our children and our youth. They are our youth, they are the future. So what do we do? What we do is that we start bringing back ishtihad, which is, an, you know, perhaps you know, it's, it's the Arabic word that means, um, you know, logic, reason, debate, discussion, something that sort of doesn't exist anymore in the Muslim world. All these young Muslims of Generation Jihad, from Canada to America and Europe, were under 25, self-taught and radicalized via the internet. How would you describe this network? It's the fusion of, of things that never really went along with each other, conservative religious beliefs, high technology, social networking online. It's a generational thing too. I mean, you do see older people getting involved in this. But the real people that are pushing this forward are young people. They're Al-Qaeda's entrepreneurs. They're the entrepreneurs of Jihad. They are taking these ideas and they're innovating in ways that has attracted the attention of Al-Qaeda to the point where Al-Qaeda has said, look, you know, you do this better than what we do. Why don't you just do it for us? Harris Ahmed is a textbook example of a young Muslim seduced through the internet into the violent ideology of Al-Qaeda. He'd recorded these videos to prove he was committed to global jihad. And it was these videos that were to be his undoing. Take pictures, man. Tent, 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 tent. This is Ethel Street, just behind the mosque where Sayyid Harris Ahmed used to live. And this is the house that he rented, number 441. This is the house that the FBI had under pretty close surveillance. This is the house to which one day in March 2005, two FBI agents came a visiting. And when they did, they were wired for sound. Mr. Ahmed. Uh, Harris on that, right? Yeah, yeah. My name is Mark Richards with the okay. FBI. All right. This is yeah, Omar. Right. Right. I have a few questions I need to ask you. Right. you have a little bit of time. When you went and knocked on Harris Ahmed's door, what did you know about him already? We knew actually a lot before we got there. We we knew 
who he was talking to were talking back and forth about jihad, and not only jihad, but violent jihad. 